Howdy folks, Dave here at Thunder Mesa Studio with another structure build for the little mining town of Thunder Mesa. Well, there are only about three structures left to finish for Thunder Mesa town. And this week, I think I'm gonna go ahead and tackle this one, the Panhandle Hotel. Now, like many of these structures in Thunder Mesa town, the Panhandle is inspired by a building that you can see uh, in the queue at Big Thunder Mountain in, uh, at Disneyland in Anaheim. Uh, it actually dates back to the original Nature's Wonderland Railroad that was there. In my opinion, it's a little small for a hotel. So I'm going to change it from the Panhandle Hotel to the Panhandle Cafe, which works better for the space that it's in on my layout. And then this little bump out section on the side can become the kitchen. Well, I did a, uh, a whole new set of uh, drawings and uh, cut some parts out on the laser. And once again, I've decided to go with uh, an MDF core structure. This is some 1 16th of an inch thick MDF. And I really like to build wooden structures this way. It, it makes for a very solid, sturdy, and square uh, structure. In fact, we use the same technique in uh, several of the kits we do from Crescent Creek Models. If you have one of the Waltz Barn kits, you'll notice that uh, it goes together in very much the same way. So, next thing I'm going to do is start putting on the um, clapboard siding. The structure, uh, the prototype has clapboard siding on three sides, the three sides that are visible to guests. We don't know what it looks like in the back here. Uh, <laughs> this side is not visible to guests, so I don't know if it's clapboard or not. What I've decided to do on the back, uh, just to be a little different and fun, is use uh, board and batten for the back wall because, you know, on a commercial street, that side's not visible. It's much cheaper um, as a construction material than, uh, than a clapboard. Now, you might notice that I did not cut all of the walls on the laser. Um, just mostly just the ones with door and window openings. Uh, it really wasn't necessary to cut them all on the laser. It's just clapboard, so it's going to be uh, pretty easy to cut with a hobby knife. And um, so these side walls, I'll, uh, I'll just do by hand. And that way I can also make sure that all the claps line up properly and everything looks nice and clean. Um, but to begin gluing pieces on, I think I'm going to start with this back wall that's board and batten. Now I can cut a piece of this clapboard siding for uh, this wall right here. This wall is mostly blank because it butts directly up against another building so there's no doors or windows or anything on this side. Also with clapboard siding you really got to pay attention to which way the clamps go. They always angle downwards. I'm going to put it on there Glue it on upside down and then, you know, <laughs> have, to, have to take it off and do it again. Right. Get a little help from some clothespins. Things are a little trickier over on this side where the bump out is because I'm going to have to um, made up three pieces of clapboard. Uh, one for the top and then two strips down each side like that. And the trick here, of course, is to cut it, uh, cut the piece right at the base of this uh, bit of clapboard so the next one will look like it's a continuation. And that should fit in there. Just like that. And this one, fit right there, like that. Now the last two pieces for the front wall. Of 
Well, after I went home for the day yesterday, I realized that I had uh, forgotten a rather important detail and something that has to be done before I, uh, before I put paint on this. And that is I need to carve away very carefully uh, the uh, slanted part of the milled clapboard so that when I put the uh, 1x6 trim on there, it'll fit down in there flush like that, you see. So I've already started to do that on this side. It's a kind of a slow and careful process. Uh, you start by uh, scribing a line here and then go through and I'm using a little chisel blade in my X-Acto knife to remove the claps very carefully. Otherwise, it'll look, it would look odd with the trim sitting up on top of the clapboard. You could probably get away with that look in uh, smaller scales, HO. You could get away with it, but in O scale, that's one of those things that's going to show. All right, well, now I can get some color on here. And I think I'm going to start out with a kind of silvery gray stain. Uh, this is my good old uh, India ink and... Uh, 70% uh, rubbing alcohol mixture. And I'll build up the, uh, the next layer of color on top of this. But I wanted to start by giving the wood a little bit of age and character. That's pretty good. I don't want to put it on too heavy because I don't want it to, A, I don't want it to warp, and I don't want it to darken the wood too much. For the main color on my structure, I'm going to use a product that I don't use very often. And it's one of these uh, smoke and mirror solutions from uh, Wild West scale models. I have a few bottles of this stuff. And um, I'm going to use the light beige. It's a, it's a thin acrylic wash, basically, is what this stuff is. Um, if you put it on unsupported wood, it will very often warp it in my experience, but since I have this stuff uh, built up uh, so nicely, I don't think I'll have a problem with warping. At least I hope not. I'm going to start over here on this wall. You can see how thin that goes on. And I'm just using a soft, I think this is a number eight brush here. Well, after three coats, I like the way that looks. That's starting to come together. That's uh, close to the color I was going for. So the next thing I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to dry brush a lighter shade on, and that will really make this pop and bring out the details of that, uh, of that clapboard siding. OK, I've got everything I need here to do some dry brushing. Um, I'm going to use a color I love to use called Unbleached Titanium. It's a nice uh, light, neutral, beige. Um, any any good acrylic in the same range would work. I like it because it's nice and thick, so it's excellent for dry brushing. And I've got a couple of mongoose, <laughs> synthetic mongoose br bristle brushes, which are, you don't have to go out and buy these specific brushes if you want to try this stuff, but um, I like these. These are actually old oil painting brushes. And... Uh, they're not as stiff as hog's hair, and, but they are uh, stiffer than, say, uh, sable. So it's kind of a in-between, kind of a medium. And with dry brushing, I've got a piece of corrugated cardboard here. I want to get all 99.9% .9 of the paint off. And um, I don't know if that I mentioned this, but when you're staining, you always, you always want to go with the grain, right? When you're dry brushing, you tend to go against the grain. So you go the opposite way, like this. And what I'm going for here, I'm just hitting the bottom edge of these claps. And come around and go the other way. Now down here at the base, something I like to do is put it on a little bit heavier. So it looks like it's been... Uh, faded out, um, kind of desaturated from rain and water splashing up on the side of the building. 
you can see how it just highlights the bottom of that clapboard. It really makes it pop. And there you can see it, the difference uh, between the dry brushed and the non-dry brushed. You can really see how that brings out the details. There we go. I think that will work. Well, I did a little experiment with some uh, some one by six for the corner trim. Uh, just trying to figure out the color I want to make it. And uh, this this building, uh, the prototype is is very beigey and brown, you know. <laughs> so we're kind of sticking with uh, that whole palette there. And I just used some uh, good old red oxide primer uh, right out of the spray can on that and I, I like the way it looks so I'm going to go ahead and uh, do the rest of the trim and paint up all the the doors and windows also get those ready to install now you can see how uh, carving away that clapboard really helps with the fit and finish kind of just makes a notch for this to slide right down into now the front facing piece goes on just the same way. Just slide on into that little notch and overlaps the side piece on the corner for a nice finished look. And before I get uh, too much further on the trim, I'll talk a little bit about how the uh, how the doors and windows go together. Um, these are laser cut from some uh, twenty five thou laser board which is this uh, like very thin sort of uh, plastic impregnated MDF which is uh, very handy stuff for, for this kind of application and they're built up in layers um, to get that 3d look see and I'll turn it over so you can see there's the interior window pane and that's the part that fits back uh, into the uh, the opening in the structure and then the casements and everything are built up piece by piece from from uh, from parts that have been laser cut and I wanted to get them all assembled and painted before I put the glazing in and then after the glazing in, is in then I can actually uh, install them in the structure I also want to finish up the uh, the back of this false front here so I'm going to build it up board by board and I've got some um, O scale one by eights that I've already uh, stained and I'm just going to cut them to length as I go here these are going to be uh, diagonal boards, obviously. I'm going to follow the pitch of the roof right up, which is pretty common practice. I decided to go ahead and uh, work on the cornice a little bit. So I built it up with a piece of uh, scrap from my scrap box, some 1 32nd of an inch thick basswood. And now I'm doing the same color treatment on it that I did on the rest of the structure. The, uh, the cornice on the structure is really very plain um, compared to a lot of Victorian buildings. It's very just kind of blocky and gothic looking. A little decorative strip here right along the top. And I've got this uh, top piece which is made out of some 332nd of an inch thick basswood. And I can center this on here best I can. Doesn't look too bad. A little touch up and everything will be dandy. Well I was able to finish up the cornice with some uh, scale one by two trim down here in the bottom and some very very tiny uh, crown molding up here from my scrap box uh, just at the base of the top. Um, I also uh, got the trim installed on the bump out section. This is one by six once again, uh, but it's painted a bone white, and I used one of my favorites, uh, Montana colors, uh, bone white for that. And also for the windows, that will just drop right in there, like so. All right, got all the windows glazed. But on these uh, windows, on the these little windows on the bump out here, um, I actually don't want people to be able to see through those. I want to fog the glass. So I'm going to use one of the oldest tricks in the book, 
some Scotch Magic Tape, which as you can see is a kind of a fogged matte finish. Put that over the glazing, like so. Do the other one here too while I'm at it. There we go. Get that down in there. Air bubbles out. Now I'll just trim around the edges here. If you watched my uh, video on glue, you know I don't like to use tape for a lot of things, but this is actually a good use of tape. <laughs> It works good for this. So now those windows will be semi-opaque. Look maybe like they're dirty from uh, being in the kitchen. Now I can start gluing the doors and windows into place. Use the window frame as a guide. Get that properly positioned. Do this fancy gothic upstairs window next now both the front and rear doors need uh, doorknobs once again I'm going to use a good old reliable Atlas track nail put it right through the hole and uh, put some CA on the back here Not bad. Now this structure is going to have a removable roof so I can access the uh, the interior of it, but um, I'm not going to build a full-on rafter trusses because um, it's, re it's just really not needed. Uh, instead, you know, I want to have the look of rafters, so I've created these uh, strips here with the rafter tails poking out so when the roof is installed on there, you'll get the look of rafters at the edge of the roof without having to build the actual roof trusses. And to do that, I just created a couple of uh, laser cut pieces. This is the uh, the brace on the top that holds the rafters. And then I've got some, um, just the little rafter tails cut out of some uh, 1 32nd of an inch thick stock. So I need to put, uh, I've already done the two on this side. So I just need to flip it around and do the one over here. I've stained it and colored it to match the rest of the uh, structure, so it's ready to go. Just need to glue it on. So glue down in that slot, and the rafter tail should just slot right in there like that. Well, let me show you what I've been up to for the last couple hours or so. Um, I've gone ahead and installed uh, a three millimeter yellow LED in the uh, kitchen bump out section. I've shingled the roof for that section using some uh, peel and stick uh, O scale cedar shingles that have been lightly stained. I wanted kind of a, a new looking roof. Um, the roof itself, the roof panel is just some um, 32 thou chipboard. And I braced it with some 1 8 by 1 8 uh, basswood stock here so that it will fit right down inside here and kind of lock into place just like that. And uh, so those uh, those braces help lock it into the interior building of the building and also um, prevent light leaks from happening up around the edges of the roof. Well, I think it's safe to say that we are in the home stretch with this build. Um, I just finished building the uh, removable roof for the main section, I'll just show you how that goes together. It's just some uh, laser cut uh, chipboard, and I uh, did some illustration board ends here to match the uh, the peak of the roof, and then just braced it all with some uh, some six by six. 
and that just uh, pops right in and off of there. But now what I want to do is go in and uh, finish any interior details. Now the upstairs window on the prototype has lace curtains in the window. So once again, I'm using some white crepe paper to simulate that. One thing about cutting crepe paper is your knife has to be really super sharp. A new blade is preferable or it will just tear. Cut this in half. So we've got two one inch wide pieces. And then we fold these over, fold them in half to make our curtains. Stick those together. I'm going to trim off that rough edge there. Fold this one over. There we go. Now I'm going to make a curtain rod to fit inside of this window casing. I'm just going to cut it right out of this round toothpick. And I'll put these two together so that the folded edge matches up on the inside. Some glue on this toothpick. I'll let that dry. Now I can trim these flush with the edge of that rod. Okay, that should fit right inside that window casing. Put some glue on this side. A couple of dabs at the corners here. go. I've got them in the front and the back. Now the back door, I've just used a piece of manila file folder paper uh, for a blind. And then on this big front window, on the prototype, the top half of the window has a, has a blind like that, and the bottom half has another lace curtain. So I'm going to make a curtain for that, and also one for the front door. Now for the uh, little half curtain that goes in the big window, I did it exactly the same way, except I added a little piece of ruffle on the top there, also made from good old crepe paper. So that is the curtain for the front door. Kind of an hourglass shape. In retrospect, <laughs> hindsight being 2020, probably would have been a lot easier, at least with the door one, to do that one before the door was installed. There we go. Well, now I want to create like a little interior set that will go down in here and uh, be visible behind the front door and window uh, rather than a full interior. And I'm calling it a set because that's exactly what it is. It's just going to be a little thing like this. Uh, wooden floor, wall with a doorway, another wall behind it, a couple things on the wall there just to look like there's something inside of the building. Uh, and I'm, once again, I'm doing it out of some, uh, some Crescent illustration board. This is some hot press illustration board. It's about, oh, about a sixteenth of an inch thick. Um, and the first thing I want to do is make this floor look like a wood floor. So I'm going to, uh, Draw some, make some hash marks, and then scribe some boards into it. We'll just make them a foot apart. Now I'll take a Minwax Early American, I think, and just stain the boards like that. And that gives us our floor for our interior set. The walls, I'm just going to leave them natural, the natural uh, kind of off-white color, that kind of bone white that the illustration board comes in. Now I want to frame in this interior doorway. 
using some uh, just some one by four uh, pre-stained with the same early American. And one thing I knew I had to include in my version of the panhandle was uh, a portrait of the man himself, uh, Barnabas T. Bullion, a.k.a. Imagineer Tony Baxter. Um, this Easter egg is also in the panhandle at uh, Disneyland. So I just had to include it there. Visible in the window when your train goes by, so have a look next time you're on the ride. And on the opposite wall here is an old dinner menu from the Red Wagon Inn, which is now known as the Plaza Inn uh, at the hub, the end of Main Street. This is from the very earliest days of the park, the Red Wagon Inn. Now the back wall here, so just uh, something visible through the doorway. It should fit right here. When you look through the window, look who you see. <laughs> now, to light the structure, I'm using three 3 millimeter LEDs, uh, two in the main part of the structure and one, as you saw, I already installed in the uh, in the bump out section. The one in there is a, uh, a warm, not a warm white, a uh, yellow flickering. And the two in the main section are... Uh, two that I've bunched together. One is a three millimeter yellow flickering and one is a warm white. I, I like the combination of those two together. It gives just the right glow for a for an oil lamp or kerosene lantern. So now all I have to do is uh, solder all of these connections together. Um, all of the, uh, uh, the negative connections which are black wire and all of the positive connections which will be red wire. Before I put the roof on, I just wanted to show that uh, how I mounted the lights in there. That's just a blob of hot glue. That's all that's holding that in there, and that's just enough. Be easy to change if I need to. I'm about uh, halfway through shingling the main roof. In fact, exactly halfway through. But uh, before I continue, I wanted to show you uh, a couple of important things. Uh, one thing a lot of people skip and when they're doing a roof or don't know about is a little strip down here at the bottom. You can cut this off of the shingle material you're using, or you can use a piece of strip wood, a thin piece of strip wood, you know, one by or something. Uh, and what this does is it lifts that bottom uh, layer of shingles up in a much more prototypical fashion than if you would just to glue it to the roof. It also gives uh, something uh, behind those shingles, something to see behind the uh, the breaks in the in the strip shingles like this. So, just a little tip: if you're not doing that uh, when you shingle roofs, it uh, really improves the look. I'm going to go ahead and start the first course on here. Sometimes with these peel and stick, it's uh, it's a lot easier to stick a knife in there and peel the backing off like that. I always put a little glue at the end of each course too, so. Sometimes the uh, the adhesive on these will uh, will dry out and it'll it'll uh, um, peel up at the ends and I don't like seeing that so put a little glue down there to prevent that happening. Now I added very little color to these shingles. I uh, airbrushed them with a light wash of uh, the same uh, alcohol and India ink stain that I use on the wood. And just to just to age them and gray them down just a little bit, I'm kind of going for the look of uh, newer shingles on a on a building that was uh, recently constructed. So don't want them to look too old and worn out, at least not yet. I'll probably add a little more weathering uh, to them with chalks uh, before I call the model finished. But uh, for now, I kind of like the way it looks. So I'm gonna cut this one in half. It's another thing. Um, Got to make sure they overlap properly. Sometimes you have to trim off the end of a shingle to get them to uh, properly overlap. 
I also want to make some provisions for a uh, smoke jack. I've got a little plastic smoke jack here from Model Tech Studios that I've painted flat black. And I want to add some uh, flashing here. So I've created a little square uh, Bristol board. Uh, you could use styrene also or anything that's thin and you know easy to cut and drill. Um, I'm just going to glue this right under the roof. You want it to go over one row of shingles down here, and then the other shingles will cover uh, cover the uh, edges in the top of it. Right about like that. Don't want to glue that in yet. I want to wait until after the roof is all shingled. It'll overlap the top, just the top of the flashing like that. Now when I get up to the, the crest of the roof here, I like to finish it off with a row of, of cap shingles. And this is a good use for all those little pieces that were just uh, being cut off the ends. Take them and uh, I take two, uh, pairs of shingles like this and then kind of taper them at one end. Just a little bit. I want to start at the uh, the gable end here, not the end at the, the, the bust of the false front. If there was no false front on this building, you would start at each side and work your way towards the middle with the cap shingles. And that would be a prototypical way to do it. And I just put one down on there like that. Let's get it so it overlaps just a little bit. And then fold it over and pinch it up. About there. Fold it over, pinch it up. And then you just continue all the way till you get to the end. And now I can glue that smoke jack in. I'm going to use some thick CA. I'm going to put a lot of it on because I'm going to gusset this a little bit. Make sure it doesn't come out. And I'm going to use baking soda. Yep. Make this a really strong joint. It's like there's snow on the roof, doesn't it? Now when that dries, I'll just uh, stain it with some black paint. It'll look like soot on there. All right. Got the roof on there. And now... I can uh, start thinking about the porch. I built a porch awning already. This is out of some uh, 1 32nd of an inch scribed uh, birch plywood. I uh, did some framing on there with some scale 2x4s. I already shingled it. It's pretty much ready to install. But I'm going to try something yeah, a little tricky. Um, for this model, the board sidewalk is already in place. Um, and on the prototype, uh, it has a couple of what are probably, I don't know, six by six posts going down uh, to the board sidewalk. And then there's a railing in front, which I'm going to do. Um, I've cut some, uh, some laser cut pieces for that. But uh, in order to get the height and everything right, uh, I'm gonna go to, I'm gonna have to attach this porch awning first and have it just kind of hang in there and then I can take it over to the layout and get an exact measurement for the height of those posts and that then all of this is going to be like a unit that just sits on top of the uh, the board sidewalk I've done something similar before so I think it'll work um, the first thing is to glue this onto the structure. For that I'm going to use some some Eileen's. I want something thick and to fill gaps and also set quickly. Make sure it's good and straight. Align it up visually with the clapboard. Not bad. Looks like two and a quarter inches. 
Now I can put this main support together. This is nice and square. Just line it up with my cutting mat here. Like that. For a little extra strength, I'm going to add something that the prototype doesn't have. And that's some um, 45 degree angle braces. A little bit stronger. Also gives it a nice Wild West kind of look. These uh, sections of uh, porch rail or, or balustrade are actually, this is just a laser cut piece of some um, uh, 25 thou laser board. And then I uh, glue on some uh, strip wood on each side. These are, are one by twos. And then on top, it gets a one by four for the top rail like that. Makes a nice dimensional, strong, a uh, bit of architecture. All right, I'll let all the glue dry on that, and then I can paint it a complementary color for for the building. Um, on the prototype, it's kind of a weathered gray, almost like uh, raw wood. Um, I think I'm going to do something different. I think I'm going to paint it that kind of uh, bone white color. That, to match the trim on the uh, the bump out kitchen, and that'll really make it pop. Otherwise, I think if I painted it uh, that oxide red, it might be a little too dark. This lined up. That goes right there. Well, that actually worked pretty good. Now I can go ahead and finish the sign. For the sign, I've created something in Photoshop based on the sign at the park and um, printed it out on some good paper and laminated it to some Bristol board to make it a little bit thicker. Now I'm going to cut this out. And I've got a laser cut sign board and I've painted these with some uh, Montana colors. What color is this? <laughs> ah, there it is. Montana colors uh, Verde. Well, that's green. Green. <laughs> now I can take some fine sandpaper and just carefully go around, around that. Make sure it matches the edges of this laser cut piece. Now, I've got this border that's really going to bring it all together. Get some glue on the back of that. And this just drops right down on the top of this. Line it up with this corner first, I think. And then on the outer edge, I've got a strip of Bristol board that I've painted the same shade of green. It's about to scale six inches wide. Glue this piece on the bottom. And then I can cut and trim it on both sides. Already did the arc over the top. The, uh, the prototype sign has some cool turned spindles along the top. There's seven of them, in fact. And I'm going to represent those with some straight pins, kind of with the big round ball on the end. Before I glued this on, I, I measured um, hole, uh, where the holes would go uh, for seven of these, and I've gone ahead and painted them up. So I just need to cut each one to length, drill a little hole, and put them in. Now, occasionally, if you use uh, rattle can paints, like I sometimes do, um, you're going to need to touch up some colors. And uh, which brings up the question, how do you match 
that uh, rattle can color? Well, you don't. Uh, <laughs> short answer, I just uh, spray some into a cup like this and uh, use a small brush, just dip it in there and go around and do my touch up. And then, uh, you know, this dries out and I throw the whole thing away. But the um, thing is, you want to do it in a well-ventilated area. You don't want to breathe in those fumes because you're spraying a whole bunch of it in the cup to get, uh, just to get some liquid, a liquid version of the paint. Then you just use a regular lacquer thinner, uh, paint thinner, to uh, clean up your brush when you're done. Now to mount the sign up on the roof, I've added a strip of 2x4, which has been stained. I want it to sit upright like this, and the, you know the roof pitches out, so I've got to kind of glue it on the edge. Over here on the uh, the bump out section, I'm just carving away a small square of the clapboard because I want to add a, a smoke jack here coming out from the kitchen because presumably the stove would be right here. That would be the logical place for it. So carving out a little place uh, for the flashing around the smoke jack to sit recessed back into the clapboard. And here is the smoke jack. This is a Titchy Trains casting. Now I've got a couple of pieces of uh, music wire that I'm going to use as uh, to make guy lines for the smoke jack. I'm going to do a little light weathering. First, I want to get some rust on the, the smoke jack, especially down here at the bottom. Just using some orange and burnt sienna chalk. Get some soot on here. Just use some black chalk. All around this flashing should be pretty dirty and sooty. I'll get a coat of clear fix on there. And then I think it's ready to put on the layout. All right. Just uh, working it into the scene here with some weeds and flowers and grass and stuff like that. Still quite a bit of work to do, uh, especially around back in this alley between uh, the undertaker shop and the cafe. It just uh, calls out uh, for some old junk, uh, some crates and barrels and maybe old kitchen equipment and things like that, <laughs> uh, clogging up that alley back there. It's, it's, it's a good place for accumulating clutter. But right now, I think I really wanna see what the whole thing looks like in night mode. And that, my friends, is the story of the Panhandle Cafe. Thank you so much for watching that entire build video. I hope you got something good out of it. If you like this kind of content, don't forget to subscribe down below. Or you can go over to uh, follow Thunder Mesa on Instagram at thunder.mesa. Or see all the builds and projects at Thunder Mesa Studios' website. That's thundermesa.studio. Until next time, keep moving forward, everybody, and adios for now.